In this video, I want to talk about what we can know and can't know in terms of our scientific understanding of the world. And it is my great pleasure to be here with uh, Marcus uh, Di Satoi from Oxford University. You are the Simonai, Simonai Professor of... For the Public Understanding of Science. Which is a grand title. <laughs> yes. And, and, and in a way... Footsteps to fill as well. Yes, sir. I took over from Richard Dawkins. So, yeah. yeah. So you, you've written a book on what we can and can't understand in terms of science. Um, maybe you can tell me a little bit more about that book. Well, it sort of grew out of taking over this job from Richard Dawkins in, in, in a way, because um, it's such a grand title, you know, the, the Professor for the Public Understanding of Science. Um, and I think when I took over this job, uh, a lot of people thought, oh, well, here's the guy who knows the whole of science. So, you know, I used to get journalists <laughs> phoning me up and just asking me, uh, you know, every question under the sun. Um, and it, it got me thinking, actually, um, uh, it's interesting because no one scientist today can know all the science that we have uh, on the books. Um, probably you have to go back to Newton or Galileo to, mm -hmm. for a, a scientist who kind of knew everything that we knew at that time. But I started to think more interestingly about, well, OK, no one scientist can know it all. But could science at some point come to a junction when we, we actually have answered all the big problems of science? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about the end of history at the end of the uh, 20th century. Um, that's proved to be wrong. There's a lot more history uh, still going on. But uh, some people talk about, uh, you know, a theory of everything. Um, that science may pay, come up with uh, an equation that can somehow um, explain it all. Um, so I was interested actually to uh, look at um, how, how powerful science could be. And, and maybe there are questions that um, science will never be able to answer. Um, uh, and, you know, there's certainly questions we still don't know. We don't know what dark matter is. Um, uh, we don't know uh, what dark energy is. Um, uh, whether there's alien life out there. But I think these are things we will learn. So I was interested in whether there were any kind of fundamental limitations to, to what science could know. Um, and that partly grew out of um, the fact that I took over from Richard Dawkins as well, because, um, of course, Dawkins became very famous um, for his attacks on religion. Um, and so a lot of people, uh, as well as asking me questions of science when I took over this job, also asked me what my religious beliefs were. Um, and um, uh, I remember being in a debate and, uh, on the radio and a journalist asking me, you know, do you believe in God? And you see, as a mathematician, um, I'm quite good at proving whether things exist or they don't exist, but I need a very clear definition of what it is we're trying to prove. So, so when he said this, I sort of countered and said, well, give me a very good definition of what you mean by God, mm -hmm. and then let's, let's try and explore that. And he came back with, um, well, God is something which can't be defined. It's the thing which is ununderstandable, uh, this kind of idea of transcendence. Um, and originally I thought that's a cop-out because I now can't use my scientific tools to understand that. But then I thought, well, that's interesting because that's quite a good definition then. Why don't we take that as a definition? The things that we can never know um, as a definition of God. It's almost what the journalist kind of defined it as. Um, so... I was sort of almost exploring from a scientific point of view, well, what are the things which will always transcend us as scientists and humans? Um, is there anything? So that was the journey of the book. Um, so what, what are some of those things? Well, I mean, there are uh, some uh, kind of... I broke it up into what I call seven different edges of knowledge that I thought um, had perhaps limitations. And, and they vary from the very small, um, you know, do we know... Uh, what the kind of ingredients are that make up the, the universe. Uh, we originally thought that there were atoms like hydrogen and oxygen, um, and then actually we pulled those apart and found actually, no, they're not uh, indivisible. They're made up of electrons and protons and neutrons. And at one stage we thought those are the basic building blocks, you know. And then we've discovered that, oh no, th these come apart as well. So now we have um, these things, quarks, which make up the protons and the neutrons. Our generation now think that these are the indivisibles, mm. but history shows us that um, time and again, things sort of pull apart and become even more um, sort of uh, smaller. So, so there's an interesting question. Could we ever know that we'd hit the bottom or could it maybe it keeps on infinitely dividing mm. into smaller and smaller bits? So, so the kind of question of the infinitely small, um, but what about the infinitely large? Uh, our universe, is it infinite or 
Is it finite? Um, uh, it's definitely a question that blows my mind all the time. It's probably the one question that blows my mind all the time. I think when, um, when I lie somewhere, look into the stars. Exactly. And I just think, what what is behind that? So I think you know it's a question there. that's um, uh, you know in intrigued us uh, ever since we've been looking up at the night sky. Mm. And it's a question I think that um, many children will ask about, well, what if I took a spaceship out, you know, do I just go on forever or or would I hit a wall? Mm. Um, you know, I don't think we're living in the Truman Show with a sort of bubble around us and a film crew looking on the inside. Of course, that was the ancient model, that the, the ancient Greek model was that we had a sort of globe with stars on it and, and somehow we were contained in science. But it always poses a question, well, but what's on the other side of the wall? Yeah, some, some people believe we, we live in a simulation. <laughs> well, exactly, that's a, but, another. But there must be something beyond the simulation too. Yeah. I, I think that uh, we actually have proof that we live in a simulation because um, we've had Trump elected and Brexit happen <laughs> and uh, this simulation's gone horribly <laughs> wrong and the program has just left it to, um, to run and, and is trying a little other universe. But, uh, um, but so I think the question of whether our universe is genuine the infinite could well be a question that we would never be able to know. If, if it is infinite, how could we ever know that we, uh, we, we, you know, as much as we travel out there, we'd never be able to to know that there might be some way that we come back to the beginning, or or does it go on forever? Mm. So there are those kind of uh, you know big physics questions, mm. but but some of the other questions are you know more fundamental to us as humans. Uh, I think one of the great scientific and philosophical questions is. Um, what is consciousness? And how could we tell whether um, the machines that we're currently making might one day become conscious? Um, and, you know, I, I'm assuming that you're conscious, but you may just have sent your avatar along today to interview me and you're sitting at home with your, your feet up. Um, and, and so I think... I would love to do that. <laughs> well, I, you know, sort of... Uh, um, um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and then there are a lot of uh, interesting movies exploring the idea of, you know, creating a machine, which, you know, uh, Blade Runner is one of the first. To, mm. You know, how can you ever really know what's going on inside? Um, so that's a very interesting question because, uh, you know, philosophers have said for uh, some time that this is a question science can't answer. Um, now, science is making great inroads into understanding the brain. We have um, an amazing telescope now, the, the fMRI scanner, EEG, can see what a brain is doing when it's kind of active and conscious and awake. Um, so, you know, we have tools, but, but it's still genuinely a challenge. Could we ever really know, even if it passes all the tests, that there is something going on inside? So, um, so that, that's one of the other kind of unknowns. And I think, I mean, this is another question I, I think about a lot especially when I think about AI and machine learning. Do you have any views on this? Do you, do you think machines can develop a consciousness? Well, I do, yes. I, I, I think that, um, you know, our own consciousness is just a lot of atoms put together in a, an incredibly clever way, um, which, you know, with this synaptic and neuronal activity suddenly produces a sense of itself. Um, now, I don't think there's any mysterious ingredient that we're missing um, in, in our description of science. So I think it's about the way this thing is put together. Now, uh, so I don't think there's any a priori reason why uh, um, we put together atoms in, a, in a, some sort of machine that it, it also couldn't become mm. aware of itself. Um, but the, the challenge is, well, how do we do that? And I think this is what might prevent us being able to do it, is that, um, you know, our own consciousness has evolved over millions of years of evolution. Um, so uh, will, is there a fast track way to make a, a machine conscious or will it also have to go through kind of a very deep time sense of evolution before this thing emerges. So, so that for me is the challenge. I think there's no reason why uh, a piece of kit might not become conscious, um, but I, I, I really haven't got any idea about a time scale for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think we will have to uh, we will have to sort of sort this problem out because um, you know our technology is becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, Artificial intelligence has uh, made extraordinary uh, progress in the mm. last few years. It's almost starting to create its own subconscious because code is becoming so complex, we don't really know how it's making its decisions. 
it also doesn't seem to be able to articulate quite why it decided to do one thing or another. And so we're already needing tools to sort of understand not a conscious world, but a sort of hidden world mm. of code. Um, but there could well become a point where this code becomes complex enough that um, some sort of consciousness, emotional world is inside there. And if that does happen, then we might have to give it rights. We might have to really reassess um, uh, the role of AI in our society. I think we're already facing that question when it comes to animals. You know, animal consciousness we think is on some sort of spectrum, mm -hmm. but I think we do need to understand this. We may not be able to genuinely solve what is consciousness, but I do think we need to make scientific progress to be able to understand more deeply how conscious um, the different animals are and how conscious a piece of kit might become. And there are many people that believe that this is just the next phase of our human evolution. Yes, there are some very pessimistic people who think that, um, uh, you know, in years to come, humans will just be in zoos behind bars and the AI will come and visit and say, what? Mm. Look, this is what we evolved from. Um, uh, and so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, existential angst about um, the progress of AI in our society. And, and, you know, you have people like Stephen Hawking who, are, who you know, made some statements before he died being genuinely frightened mm -hmm. about what we might be unleashing. Elon Musk as well, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but Elon Musk, um, it's interesting, a lot of his kind of commercial projects actually are looking to solve um, some great existential problems. So, um, you know, for example, a Tesla car is about trying to solve uh, how to store sustainable energy. Uh, it's about creating a good battery. Um, uh, so he's, he's interested in solving these big problems. So I think the idea of the singularity when AI might take over, um, he's now got this thing called Neuralink, which he's trying to develop, which is in some sense saying, okay, if this is an evolutionary process, let's, let's make sure that we as humans keep a pace with the evolutionary progress. So maybe we can augment ourselves with kit such that we will... Uh, be as intelligent as the AI as it grows, so that we will be able to sort of integrate with, in a, in a sense, we will become the AI. We will start to have, I mean, we already have things in our pockets and our hands and our glasses which are augmenting our intelligence, but maybe something more interesting neuronally, mm. which will mean that actually this never becomes uh, a crisis because we, we are the evolution mm. of um, human and AI together. So what, what are some of the key messages then from your book on what we cannot know, so what we can never know? I think uh, one of the things is that um, there are still a lot of things we do not know. Mm -hmm. um, I think many people feel that um, surely science has answered all the big problems. There are still lots of exciting things out there, uh, new stories to tell. Um, I think it's also uh, Im important that people realise there are limitations to science, because I think uh, science is so all-powerful um, uh, all pervasive that people sort of feel it should have the answer to everything and so I think we have to recognize that there are limitations um, to what science can do and also that um, the perhaps we need to think of uh, a, a more positive dialogue perhaps with science and society and issues of religion uh, for example um, and that we look for ways that we can share our different ways of looking at the world um, uh, r rather than polarising the whole debate. Yeah, fantastic. That's actually a fantastic point to end. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you.